Hello, welcome. This is Matt from Unreal 73. Uh, welcome to uh, another episode. Today we're doing. I'm doing my review of uh, Book Two of Patricia Patricia A. McKillop's Riddle Stars or Riddle Master trilogy. Uh, the book is entitled Air of Sea and Fire. It's the second book. If you recall, I did the first book about a week ago. So I would recommend, at the very least, you watch that review. Um, now, now, note, in order to, um, to, to review this book properly, I'll have to do some spoilers for the first book. I'm going to try, I'm going to, try to keep the big spoilers out of it, but I do have to do a couple. Uh, just to set up to make sure because there are some points from the first book that you need to focus to under to understand the context of the review I'm going to do for this book, the non-spoiler parts. So mostly with the character motivation, what I found fascinating, what I think you'll find fascinating. There'll be some minor spoilers for this for book two, but there won't be a lot. Uh, so second. As I mentioned, I previously uh, preview, reviewed Riddle, the Riddle Master of Head about a week or so ago, episode 16 of my, I think it was. Uh, I'll have a link to it but down below, hopefully at the end of this video, if I figure out how to do that. I'm brand new to this stuff. So, uh, bear with me. Now, in that previous video, I, did, I, just, I discussed Patricia and Michaela, who she was, uh, some of her work in general in more detail. So I'm not going to rehash that all here. I love to say Patricia A. McKillop is an award-winning author. Uh, she's still alive and active uh, for this trilogy. Uh, and she's almost famous book is The Forgotten Book. Most well-known book, I should say, is The Forgotten Beast of Eld. Yeah. Uh, now, as I mentioned, I'll be doing some spoilers um, for, for the first book. I have to go over two particular concepts. Uh, so, of uh, things that were mentioned in the first book, to, and some discussion of them, so we can discuss the motivation of the characters that I found fascinating and why I think you might. So, if you want zero spoilers for the first book, stop here. If you want, if you want zero spoilers for, for the second book, but they would be minor spoilers, stop here. So, the two concepts that are critical to understand from the first book, in the sense that and you do learn more about these concepts as they go on, which I'm not going to discuss the future stuff. But the two things uh, that you learn in the first book are about something called the land rule and a character called the high one. The high one is, is the first thing we're going to discuss. Uh, the high one is the last of the ancient Earth Masters. We, we've met the last of the Earth Masters' children who had been condemned to a torturous death by their own powers as Morgan as Morgan met them. So when he, when he received the mysterious object that were uh, they held that bore the same three stars that he had. The the object was crafted by the ancient wizard Yerth, uh, spelled Y R T H. So, uh, he he created both the harp Morgan received and the other object. And it was a thousand years before he was born. And we learned he also put many of the earth. Uh, it seems to be the origin of many of the ancient riddles you read about regarding the star bearer, such as who is the star bearer and what will he bring, for example. And that was about a thousand years before the t Morgan was actually born. Now, as I prepared to um, do this review uh, in my scripting and my prep work, just so I had to have my thoughts in order. I happened to be watching a, mod a, a TV show called Yellowstone. Uh, so, well, not Yellowstone itself, but its prequel series, 1883. And it was, you know, it was episode 7 of season 1. And I'm not going, I don't want to spoil that either. You should watch that. It's a good show. Uh, there was a tornado descending upon the pioneers. And that tremendous force uh, of nature, of the earth and the wind and the sky combining to just be something a human being on their own cannot withstand. An inevitability. If it hits you, odds are you're dead. You know, 99.99 percent chance you were standing there. A tornado comes right through where you are. You're going to die, and that's an awesome power. And in the context of this, what it reminded me of, in the context of these novels, the Earth Masters had effortless command over those powers. 
They were the masses of the earth. The, the th when, the, when we say the earth, we don't just mean the ground. We mean the earth as a world, the planet. Now, I don't know if that's a reference that this is some future or like some mystical, like fictional future or fictional past that uh, Miss McKill was kind of building into our world or not. I might have to do some research on that because I, I, I've read this book so many times, but started so long ago. I never, and I never noticed any sequels that she ever wrote to it. So the series, so I've concluded she, and back then there wasn't like an internet where, you know, there were thousands of, of interviews with the authors and fan sites and wikis gathering every last detail the author mentioned or, or if the author sent a letter to a, a newspaper about something and happened to mention one line about a book and that's preserved forever on the internet, you know. Oh, when you come to think of it, how much has actually happened, now that we know how much is actually out there that can just casually recorded and we can find on the internet, how much content that people produce in terms of letters and talks and discussions that just don't exist except in people's memories anymore. But that's another topic for another day, perhaps. So in book one, uh, as we, we also learn uh, of the Earth Masters and their unknown enemies who commanded some sort of forces uh, and they fought a war, the Earth Masters and their ancient enemies. And we learn that in Imrus. Uh, Imrus was, a, even though it's popular with humans now, it was devastated by those ancient wars, as Astrid Imrus tells us. Now, and those were, those were before the, uh, the settlement of the land by the humans. Now, who is the High One? The High One is known as, to be an Earth Master. He's the last of the Earth Masters and possesses mastery over all the lands. The land, and they're called the lands of the settlement by the people, the humans who live there. Uh, we, on, that, on the map I showed you previously. As a matter of fact, I will call that map up now just so we can get a little reference to it. And bear, uh, bear with me. You know, I probably should have done this before, but I didn't think I didn't think but I didn't think we'd need the map again. Sorry about that. Okay, and you should see it. I'll make it over here for now. I'll put I'll put over the book covers for now because I do want to mention the book covers near the end here. So uh, these uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse going over them or not. Um, but they are the, 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 those are the lands of the settlement, okay? And my impression is that the humans came in th from the west, okay? So, and the high one lives in Erland Star Mountain, as you learned in the first novel, on the upper left-hand corner of the lands. And Morgan more or less traveled uh, up the coast, in a sense, through the forest and over the mountains at Tehran, and then through the forest... Um, again, until you eventually wound up in Osterland, yeah. and then then he went west through the, through Isig and the pass into Erlenstar Mountain. So the High One lives in Erlenstar Mountain. He's the last of the high Earth Masters and possesses mastery of all the lands we saw on the map that I just mentioned. Uh, this means, in context, he can sense everything about them: the soil composition, what grows and what dies, what moves through them, and who who even lies dead in the ground. It grants power over everything. His power grants him power over everything, including those who lie dead. You've heard men, you heard mentioned in uh, the first book about the restless spirits of on, om, and hell, for example. Have mastery of the earth grant you power because the people were made of the earth and they lived, and when they died, they were there. So the, uh, the earth masters had even power over the dead. Yeah, and. Uh, in the years of the settlement, as again, as, uh, when humans first came to the land of the High One, there are no exact details in, the, in any of the novels. It's one of those things that uh, Miss McKill alludes to through the lore, but it's beyond really the scope of how the settlement occurred. You just didn't have to know that it did. After the ancient war between Earth Masters and their mysterious enemies, devastated the lands. So at some point, the High One establishes rule over the human people. And in that act, he granted the ruler of each land a piece of his power, uh, called the land rule, which gave them this lesser version of his power over the land, the earth and the lands I mentioned. And those are two important concepts you need to understand going forward, um, in ter especially in terms of the motivation of other characters, some of whom I will and some of whom I won't mention. Um, and again, again, I'm going to say, 
there's going to be some spoilers here. So, Er seeing fire opens in the house of the king of An, Matham, the father, the father, the, the father, 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 <laughs> the father of Rude, who we met in book one, Raiderly, who we discussed, and the previously unmentioned brother, Duak. It is a year after the end of the previous book. Um, it's in the spring, if I remember the exact time correctly. As the peoples of the realm wonder, uh, wonder and worry about, about the disappearance of Morgan, Morgan and death. And we finally meet Raiderly, Raiderly the second most beautiful woman of Ann. This, this novel begins with the aftermath of Morgan's disappearance and the realities and reactions to that truth. Um, these reactions uh, concern the seeming intransigence, intransigence, so one of those words that you feel like you're trying to tackle, tackle the, the, a running back, trying to never say it, Intransigent, intransigence of the high one, the deepening mystery of the star bearer and the growing mysterious war in Emerson. But more directly for the reader is Raiderly's reaction to Morgan's disappearance. Over the course of book one and now into book two, we learn more of Morgan and Raiderly's er prior early relationship when they were younger, uh, when Morgan was attending the, the College of the Real Masters with Rude. And, we, and they, be, they actually began to fall in love this, not, not, you know, not a deep love, yes, because they obviously had a connection based on what we read in the first and second book from both their perspectives. But they were, uh, but then the realities of Morgan's life as the Prince of Head, when he inherited the land rule much younger than he had ever thought, uh, when his father and mother passed away, as you learned in the first book very early, uh, he had to go back to Head and become the ruler of Head much earlier than he had planned. Now, in the context of the book, you can imagine that had Morgan parents lived, Morgan's parents lived, he and Raiderly might have been able to be married anyway, sort of as an alliance between uh, Head and um, An, you know, the daughter of, of Ruler Mary, a place where they get a lot of food and stuff from Mark. Head is a very strong province for growing food for the realm. That's one of the things they trade away, a lot of farm products. Uh, plus their beer, they're the, one of the bigger beer producers in realms. Uh, Rachel begins her own quest to travel to Earl Star Mountain because of her, her love and her, her anger, her growing anger at the situation. Uh, and along along the way, we meet our other two main supporting characters in this book. Lyra, the daughter of the Morgul of Heron, who we met both those characters in the last book. Uh, and another, another character we, who is uh, now a main supporting character in this book is Tristran, who we learned is the younger sister of Morgan early in the previous book. And they all want answers from Highland. Now, I'm not going to give the details of how they got together, how the journey began, other than to say Raider Lee sets it in motion when she decides she's going to get some answers. Um, and all three protagonists have a, aside from their physical journey, if you remember how Morgan was taking his physical journey, he was also going through a sort of mental and spiritual journey, trying to re reconcile certain things about his life. And all three of these characters, Raider Lee, the main character, and our two primary supporting characters, Lyra and Tristan, 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 uh, they all have that sort of journey in this. Yeah. Uh, for Lyra, the conflict is between her personal duty and her professional duty. If you remember quite often, she, be, you know, when I first read this as a kid, I thought, well, maybe Lyra is attracted to Morgan. It'll be like a romance triangle between her and Raider Lee and more, more and her. And then, but the sec after the second theory, I got the sense that Lyra was not find finding Morgan attractive, and since she might have wanted to, you know, court him and and get married and all that, um, she found his quest and his willpower and his his his. She felt she. she I got the impression that Lyra's character um, understood Morgan the journey Morgan was going on. To reconcile all the different parts of himself, and all the all the things he had been born to as the star bearer that he didn't ask for. And uh, now that, and so her personal journey, her personal duty here is is something she, she she feels she owes Morgan to be a protector and a helper in his quest because she she somehow connects to it that it's important to her. But her professional duty is she she is both the land heir of the Morgul and the captain of the Morgul's personal guard. And she and her ability to influence events as while she's just a captain, she realizes it is very limited. 
and she wants more. To, she would like. She's beginning to sense that maybe she has to grow beyond that role to use her power as a person and as the Marvel's heir to be able to do more. So who else? Who else? Obviously, do we have to mention? We have Tristan. Now Tristan is much younger than Raider Lee or uh, uh, Lyra. Raider Lee and Lyra seems to be in their early twenties, like Morgan was. Uh, Tristan is Tristan 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 is thirteen, and she. She, she's written well as being a girl, a teenage girl, who had to embrace some responsibilities when her parents died to become the woman of the, uh, you know, the princess of the island, so to speak, and the woman of the household for two older brothers. So you, you she's, a, again, but there are no badly written characters anywhere in the series, which is another great thing. Even if you meet a character with two pages, like a traitor talking to Morgan in, in uh, Hurley or, or something like that, for those two pages... Miss McKill uh, does very well with those characters. Uh, so Tristan is, is we learn, is grieving horribly for Morgan. She, and we begin to learn that the changes in Morgan's life as the Prince of Head and Star Bear didn't just affect him and Raiderly. Really, you know, his family, uh, it, uh, Eli Elias inherited the land rule all of a sudden. And we learn something I'm not going to spoil, but something that Tristan and and, and, and Eliard knew uh, even about what Morgan was experiencing. They, they didn't tell anyone because they were basically children. When you think about it, Morgan was barely, seemed to be barely around 20 years old, and his brother and sister were basically teen, a teen and a preteen. These were all children thrust into the, having to be rule their island because their parents were taken from them in a storm, you know, which we learned in the first novel. And so her journey, uh, she's looking at part of it's a grieving or coping mechanism. Part of it is, is hope that she can find Morgan alive. Part of it is she wants answers. And who wouldn't want answers if your life was torn, 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 torn to shreds by some, by some ancient prophecies and people manipulating things for a thousand plus years about your brother? And I'll say this much more as a mild spoiler. The conclusion of Tristan's journey in this in, in this book uh, is a really powerful moment. It's one of the most well-written sequence of sequences of of prose that I've ever read in a book. For the, it's about three or four paragraphs. And in the next well, in the next book uh, review of the third book, when I can spoil something in here, I will mention I think that they're very important words in a broader context. They they hit home to me. Uh, and so that's Tristan. That's Tristan. Tristan's motivations. Okay, you know why I keep messing up on Tristan? Uh, because there's a character in Arthurian lore called Tristram, and my brain keeps saying Tristram, 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 and instead of Tristan, 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 with this character for some reason. So now it's Tristan, Tristan, Tristan. Okay. So I'll see. Uh, so now we get to Raider Lee, our main character. Okay. Now I need to put this in the perspective and just. To how I connect to this character in a way. When I was four or five years old, um, like any little kid with their first crush, I fell in absolute true love with Farrah Fawcett. Uh, for the next two or three years, I knew, I just knew with the, with the utter blind like faith that a five-year-old had, you know, that Farrah Fawcett was, was going to be my wife. I was gonna, I was going to be the greatest scientist in the world and win her heart because I would be an awesome scientist and I was going to marry her and we would live forever in happiness because she was perfect, and I was going to try to be perfect for her. You know, so that, that's, I guess, a lot. We all know our first crushes when we're kids, and we get that sort of, and you're a kid, and you're naive, and, you know. So that's the kind of source perspective of what I want to mention about Raider Lee. So I read this book, The, the Air, Sea, and Fire. I'll, I'll, put the, I'll move this around a little bit so you can see the cover now of Air, and Sea, and Fire. I'll move the little mess right over here. Uh, but reference... This is the one, the paperback that I destroyed reading it, uh, uh, of the actual paperback of the trilogy. And this is the copy I have now, um, the, the, the science fiction covers, uh, unified edition. Okay. So, for reference, again, you know, referring to what I was making. So I was six or so when I read the, the Air, Sea, and Fire, especially when I read the trilogy, but Raider really, really hit home for me. Um, I guess she, I guess she was my first, you know, book character crush, if you can have this sort of thing. When you, I guess when you're a little kid and you're, and you're 
your mind is developing, you can like crush on a cartoon, you can crush on a book character, you can crush on a real person, you can crush on a uh, an imaginary, you know, it's just because your brain is just firing off all these hormones as you're all, all urging, all, as you're urging to develop as you get older, you don't know better. You know, you just, it's just the way it is. And Ra the way Miss McKillop wrote Raiderly, um, it was amazing to me. It still is, even reading it now, like the 20-something time, uh, when I read how, how thoughts, and, and the way she moves. Uh, I don't know if, if you've ever seen someone who is ethereal when they move. Um... Charlize Theron has a bit of it about her. Elizabeth Taylor, uh, Ashley Judd, uh, you know, when she moves, if you watch. I mean, well, I'm talking obviously about the how they move on, on the cinematic screen, but I've seen, like, in real life how, how these uh, women walk when they're walking around, like, at, at an award show or something. And you know, just little things, like the way they would move people, would move their arm, like, 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 it's, like it's part of the air flowing around them. I, I'm not trying to be flowery with the pros, but... The etherealness of how they move, and that's that's how regularly is described. Um, and it just when I was a little kid, it, it, that concept entranced me. And I find as now I'm 48, the women I find attractive tend to have a lot of those similar characteristics uh, that regularly had uh, in in these novels. Like it, it, you know, it influenced me very powerfully. The concept of you know. Of womanhood, in a sense, and that's one of them anyway. Obviously, the prefrontal of fire plus it, you know. Too. Uh, so, uh, you know, to get a little more on Rayleigh's character because she's important. She's the main of this. She has. She can come across as very stoic uh, when you uh, when you initially see her meeting people. But she's not stoic, and she's mildly reserved because she's cautious. She's very intelligent, more so than she lets on to most people around her. And inward, she's very fierce. She's if you mess with people she cares about or or challenge her, she is fierce, and that's another important characteristic, you know. Uh, so, and this that word, I guess, you know, books for me when I was a child were kind of like therapy and escape because some health, uh, some, that's where my mental health issues started due to circumstances of my life. And I'll leave it at that because I don't need to make this down in a video. So when I first read The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit when I was like four and uh, Silmarillion shortly after and then read Sword of Shinara, um, maybe, you know, and that's another early book I read and then th this trilogy, Dune. Uh, these books were like, uh, like therapy for me so I can understand why some of the characters in them, like, especially Ra like Raiderly, influenced my sort of thought development over my life. And it's just fascinating when, you, when we all, I'm sure we all have something like that. Uh, something that, you know, whether it's a TV show or a book or a family member, or when you're young and for whatever reason, they're very influential to you. And well, hopefully we have, some, we have more than one people, person like that in our life. I know I've had others, but... The, you know, the character really is just very strong uh, in terms of influencing certain, certain, I guess, instincts and thoughts about female characters and people. And the issue that rarely deals with is very similar to the, to the, to the, to the issues Morgan deals with. We find out that rarely has, her, her, aside from her identity as the daughter of Matthew Mavan and Sion, who's her mother's name, um, she's had another identity forced upon her, uh, and it, the, the title of the novel spoils it. So I can it's not spoil it. She's the heir of sea and fire, as we as we learn now, uh, we learn very early in the book. She has a power awakening in her, seemingly out of nowhere, just in time with Morgan. So what's going on here, you know? And but readily struggles with that throughout this novel. That is is this power because she has she has multiple bloodlines that lead to it. And it, is this power good? Is it, does, is it going to make her an enemy of her own family? Can she, does she, She's confused. Can Morgan still love her if she had this power? And Morgan has met so many of the same doubts, too. Like, does, is he no longer, did, did really love Morgan of Head, and she's going to hate the Star Bearer, you know, who's killing, who wants to kill someone, uh, has killed people before, and so forth, you know. And it's an interesting, and she, Miss McKillop does very well, which you'll, if you read this, have see, seeing the characters progress through this, which is amazing. Like, like 
it's very rare in a novel when you get one character who has the internal struggles and it goes through the process of resolving them that you can identify with and think is very well written and is very well written. Very, now we have two of our main characters of that nature doing this, as well as I mentioned with Tristan and Hard Journey, uh, Lyra, and uh, whose journey is not complete. I'm spoiling something from the third book, but her journey is not complete. You know, whereas Tristan's largely is in this book, for example. Uh, so, and some of the other participatory minor characters, um, their journeys are shorter, like, like Astra and Ymiris. Um, his journey is only very short in the book, but you can see the kind of character, and Ms. Ms. McKill writes it very well. It's a strength of our writing, the, the way characters progress through their struggles mentally and spiritually, however you want to think of it. So, in conclusion, obviously I'm recommending you read this book, read the first book, read the third book, multiple times if you like to read multiple times. Uh, if you have any questions, put you can type them out below uh, in the comments section. Uh, next up is the third book, Carpus in the Wind, probably three or four days. Maybe, I'm thinking Tuesday, uh, you know, but I, I could write it right now because I've read the book so many times, but I'm rereading I want to, just like I reread Air of Sea and Fire for this review, now I'm rereading Harper's New because I want to have it fresh in my mind and see if it, see if it pick up any new insights. Uh, which the one about the character development that Miss McKillop does, that's an insight I picked up on this one. That all she has, all of our characters, who, which the one she depicts developing, um, it's all done well. So thank you. Uh, this is Matt from Unbearable 73. Uh, if you like it, hit the like button. If you dislike it and YouTube has turned on the dislikes, hit the dislikes, uh, hit the dislike button. If you like more of my content, hit subscribe. Um, I have some links down below that relate to this. And if you want to buy this book on uh, Amazon, I have a link down below for that. Uh, for, the, for the Omnibus Edition, the modern Omnibus Edition, not the one I have there, which is uh, out, of, out of print science fiction book club edition. Um, if you wanted that one, though, it's like 18 bucks on eBay. So, you know, which is about the same price as buying a uh, brand new version on Amazon type thing. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Have a nice day.